This is a film about an artist and a painting. The artist is Marie Bashkirtsev, who was born in Ukraine, then part of the Russian Empire, in 1858, and died in Paris of tuberculosis in 1884. Her full name was Maria Konstantinovna Bashkirtseva, but she spent much of her life in France, and it is by the French form of her name, Marie Bashkirtsev, that she is best known. The painting is in the studio, which was painted by Marie Bashkirtsev over the winter of 1880 to 1881, and shows women art students at the Académie Julian in Paris, the art school where the artist was herself a student. In the studio is in the collection of Dnipro Art Museum in Ukraine. Marie Bashkirtsev was born to parents of the minor Russian nobility at Havronsi near Poltava in central Ukraine on 24th November 1858, 12th November by the Julian calendar then in use in territories under Russian rule. Her parents split up when Marie was very young. She remained with her mother, who in 1870 left Ukraine to travel in Western Europe, taking 12-year-old Marie and an entourage of relations with her. They spent time in Germany, Austria, Italy and France before settling in 1871 in a villa in Nice. There, Marie spent her teenage years socialising and travelling, but also following, at her own insistence, a programme of study in literature, history, languages, art and music, which was unusually thorough and wide-ranging for a girl of her class and era. Although herself very young, she was hungry for knowledge of all kinds and already passionate about the importance of education, for women above all. Women must receive the same education as men, she wrote in 1873. It was also while living in Nice that she began to write the journal which brought her posthumous fame. More on Marie Bashkirtsev's journal later. In 1877 she decided that she would be a painter. Before this she had hoped to become a famous singer. She has included a harp, symbolising her musical interests in this self-portrait. But her tuberculosis, initially misdiagnosed as chronic laryngitis, damaged her voice and ended her plans for a singing career. However, she had already shown a great talent and love for art, having taken private lessons in painting and drawing in Nice, and had studied art during stays in Rome and Florence, and she resolved that if she could not be a singer, she would devote herself to art and win renown as a painter. It was this ambition that brought her to Paris and to the Académie Julien in the late 1870s. The Académie Julien was situated in the Passage de Panorama off the Boulevard Montmartre. It subsequently expanded to other sites in central Paris. Among the best known of the many private art academies that flourished in Paris, it was founded in 1868 by Rodolphe Julien, a painter who had also been an artist's model and for a time either a wrestler or a prize fighter. Sources differ. From its earliest days, Julien's academy was particularly associated with artistic training for women. Initially, male and female students studied together, although segregation was soon introduced, apparently at the request of the women themselves. Julien's was notable for offering women and men the same training, including life classes with nude models. The training reflected the requirements of the École des Beaux-Arts, although women were not admitted to that institution until 1897. Julien's also welcomed foreign students and quickly became very international and cosmopolitan in character. No entrance examination was required, just the payment of a fee, which was double for women what it was for men. Marie Bashkirtsev seems to have been determined from the beginning to study at the Academy Julien which she described as the only serious art school for women to be found in Paris. She 
She joined the Académie Julian in October 1877, and during her seven years there she was highly productive and achieved significant recognition as an artist, exhibiting successfully and winning prizes before her worsening tuberculosis ended her life at the age of 25 in October 1884. She was buried at Passy Cemetery in Paris. Her elaborate tomb was commissioned by the wealthy Bashkirtsev family from the architect Émile Bastien Lepage, whose artist brother Jules had been one of Bashkirtsev's great artistic influences and closest friends at the end of her life. Jules himself died of stomach cancer at age 36, just a few weeks after Marie's death. Marie died very young, and her family, and most of all her mother, wished to memorialize her as an artistic prodigy, an exemplar of youth, beauty, and creativity, with a life full of promise that was tragically curtailed. Her richly ornamented tomb is a physical expression of this idea. Part of its decorative scheme is a carved list of Bashkirtsev's works that, literally, sets her artistic achievements in stone. The interior contains, alongside her grave, furnishings from her studio, her painting, the holy women, and various items commemorating her life. Marie Bashkirtsev's birth and death dates are carved into the facade of her tomb, on urns decorated with butterflies to emphasize the shortness and beauty of her life. But the date of birth is given as 1860, instead of 1858. This was done at the insistence of Marie's mother, who wished the world to think her daughter even younger, and thus even more of a prodigy, than she actually was. It also concealed the fact that Marie was conceived before her parents were married. The same change was made when Marie's mother edited her daughter's journal for publication. Marie Bashkirtsev had written in her journal almost daily from her fifteenth year until just a few days before her death, recording her intimate thoughts, feelings, hopes, disappointments, love affairs, state of health, and her incisive comments upon the happenings and people that crowded her short but eventful life. She had always intended her journal for publication, and after her death her mother edited all 19,000 manuscript pages into two published volumes. Madame Bashkirtsev's editorial interventions were very extensive. As well as changing her daughter's birth date and details of her early life, she rewrote or removed passages which she felt were unworthy of the Bashkirtsev family or of her daughter's memory, or simply presented events in a way which did not suit her. The result, which appeared in French in 1887 and in translations from 1890, was a publishing sensation, and posthumously fulfilled Marie's desire for fame, albeit in a way that was carefully managed by her mother. It was not until the early 21st century that the first accurate and complete editions of the journal based on Marie Bashkirtsev's original manuscripts, rather than her mother's interpretations of them, began to appear. In her journal, Marie Bashkirtsev frequently wrote of her longing for fame. I was born to be a remarkable woman. It matters little in what way or how. I shall be famous, or I will die, she declared at the age of seventeen. But her illness left her little time to pursue her artistic vocation, and when she did become famous, it was posthumously, as the author of her sensational journal, not for her work as an artist. But that does not mean her artistic achievements should be neglected. Bashkirtsev was not a dabbling amateur or an aristocratic dilettante, but a serious, dedicated and very productive artist. The catalogue, published to accompany a posthumous exhibition of her work, organised by the Union des Femmes Peintres et Sculpteurs, which she had joined in 1883, lists over 100 paintings and pastels, over 200 drawings and five sculptures, although much of her work has since been destroyed or lost. While living in Paris and studying at the Académie Julien, 
Marie Bashkirtsev came into contact with a very wide variety of people from a range of different social backgrounds and became more aware of the political, social and economic conditions around her than had been the case in her earlier years. Among other things, she became a pioneering feminist and a committed advocate for women in the arts. Her journals contain many comments on women's lack of freedom and inferior social position and the particular difficulties faced by women artists. She was a member of the Société Les Droits de Femmes, later Société Le Suffrage de Femmes, founded by the feminist campaigner Ubertine Eau Claire, and contributed to Eau Claire's journal La Citoyenne under the pseudonym Pauline Aurel, writing art criticism but also attacking the patriarchal structures, institutions and attitudes of the art world, which denigrated women's creativity, marginalised art made by women, and denied women artists rights and opportunities. Bashkirtsev not only explored these issues in her writing, she also addressed them through her art. She has not always been well regarded as an artist. The Impressionist painter Bert Morisot, for example, who admired Bashkirtsev's writing and her pioneering fight for the equality of the sexes, condemned her work as mediocre, vulgar, common, almost stupid, and criticised her dullness and academic conventionality. But such judgments disregard the ways in which Bashkirtsev challenged the established academic traditions in which she was being trained, and ignore the fact that she had little time to develop her work. She died young, with a career cut short. Her experience of life was also limited by her youth, her social class and position, and her sex. As we have seen, she often complained of the rigid conventions that restricted her freedom and opportunities as a woman and an artist. She was from a wealthy and aristocratic, if sometimes unconventional, family, and lived accordingly. Her arrival daily at the Académie Julien, elaborately dressed and accompanied by her maid, always caused amusement to her fellow students. Her life was socially highly constrained, and she did not develop a hinterland of wider experience on which to draw for her work. She could not even, as Morisot did, draw on the middle-class world of family, home and garden for inspiration. As a result, much of her artistic output is broadly representative of the kind of work produced by a relatively privileged art student within the Parisian atelier system under the influence of prevailing conservative taste and of tutors who were themselves firmly within the academic tradition. What is interesting about her work is her evidently increasing concern with looking beyond the constraints of her own experience and the limitations of her artistic formation, and her turning to realism and naturalism to inject vigour and relevance into her art. The results in works such as Jean et Jacques and Un Meeting are not only highly competent and show her mastery of the technical skills of her profession, but also convey a genuine interest in and feeling for their subjects. It is notable that these paintings became among her most popular and widely praised works. Pictures in which she invested feeling and worked with freedom, such as At a Book, also known as The Reader, At the Table, also known as Despair, and her wonderful naturalist masterpiece The Umbrella are powerful, engaging and evocative. Many of her portraits also have flair and vigour as well as showing her skills as a draftswoman and colourist. Marie Bashkirtsev's oeuvre contains many works offering hints of how her art would have developed, given more time. But time was the one thing she did not have. Marie Bashkirtsev began her career stylistically within the mainstream academic tradition of the École des Beaux-Arts, from which institution, of course, as a woman she was excluded, which underpinned the Académie Julien, the Salon, and the path of artistic achievement which she wanted to follow. But her frustration with the restrictions of academicism resulted in increasing friction with her tutors, in April 1883, she records in her journal an argument with her tutor, Tony Robert Fleury, 
over her desire to interpret what she saw freely, rather than following the classical conventions of which he was himself a master in such details as drapery. Are you saying, she protested, that I, an artist in 1883, have no choice over how I arrange the clothing in my painting? She believed the academic tradition in painting was the foundation of worthwhile artistic endeavour, but as with all foundations it was something to be built upon, indispensable but not a constraint to development. The important thing is to receive a solid and classical education, she wrote in November 1877. The rest depends on oneself. During 1883 and 1884, the last two years of her life, she increasingly rejected formulaic academic approaches. This was partly through a wish to explore and develop her own style, but it was also a result of her increasing social and political awareness. She sought to express in paint the social, political and cultural critiques expressed in print by Emile Zola, a writer she described as a giant. Her interest in realism thus developed into a commitment to naturalism, which drew her to the works of Jules Bastien Lepage, who became very close to her towards the end of her life. She sought an art that reflected urban life, the daily life of the suburbs and the streets, as a counterpart to Bastien Lepage's rural scenes. She had little time to take these aims further in her work, but despite the shortness of her career, she did achieve considerable artistic recognition, not least at the Paris Salon. The Salon, under challenge in many ways by the 1870s and 80s, nevertheless remained the single most significant and influential exhibition of art in Europe for both aspiring and established artists. Bashkirtsev had her first work accepted in 1880 and went on to exhibit in 1881, 1883, and 1884. The painting which she exhibited at the 1881 Salon was a depiction of studio life at the Academy Julien, and it is this work that is our picture in history. Mary Bashkirtsev's 1881 Salon exhibit can be seen hanging on the wall of her studio in this undated photograph. This painting has been known by a number of different names. Its title at the Salon was simply Un Atelier, while in the catalogue of her work the title is given as L'Atelier Julien, which is also the form used in the carved list of paintings at her tomb. Other names used for the picture include L'Atelier de Jeune Fille and, in English, a class in the Academy Julien. However, the most common English title for the work is In the Studio. The artist tells us in her journal that this painting was not her idea. In the last weeks of 1880, she had been trying, without success, to decide on a subject to paint for the Salon of the following year. Rodolphe Julien, proprietor of the Academy Julien, said that he would give her a subject that would be a great success at the Salon. His idea was that two students should each paint a picture of a class at his academy from two different viewpoints. Marie Bashkirtsev would paint one, and Amélie Burry Sorel, a Spanish student with whom Marie had a sometimes difficult relationship and who would eventually become Rudolf Julien's wife, would paint the other. She did not find the commission an easy one. The studio was very small. She had to ask for a partition to be taken down to make more space for her to work, and Julianne tried to get her to pay for this alteration. She also asked for a screen to work behind, to give herself more privacy when painting in the busy studio, and he tried to make her pay for that as well. The number of figures to be included presented problems both compositionally and practically. It was not easy to get her fellow students to cooperate and pose for her. She also did not like being one of two students working on the same theme, noting in her journal, I'm nervous, and when Amélie is there I can't work. It's embarrassing and irritating to be working on the same subject. In the end, only Marie's picture was finished, although it was much criticised by her tutors, and she was far from happy with it herself. As for Amélie Berry Sorel, she was so dissatisfied with her picture 
that she refused to allow it to be exhibited. In the studio is not a small picture, at one and a half metres tall and nearly two metres wide, but it creates a feeling of congestion of a small space crowded with figures and busy with activity. Amid a tangle of easels and brushes, the students are painting a young boy posing as John the Baptist. This is a life class. It is possible that early sketches for this painting included a nude adult model. In her journal for 4th January 1881, Bashkirtsev writes that when she showed such a sketch to Imbert de Saint-Armand, a French diplomat and writer who was one of her suitors, the naked model absolutely shocked him. Bashkirtsev herself had no problems with nude models of either sex, and relished the challenge of drawing and painting the nude. If she originally planned to include a nude model, and then decided against it, it was perhaps because she did not want to risk the picture being criticised as an unseemly one for a woman artist to paint for exhibition. A child model, as John the Baptist, was a safe choice, although Bashkirtsev did not like the figure she ended up with, writing that if it had been for one of her weekly exercises, she would have scraped it off. It's common and lacks character, the worst thing in the picture. The women students pictured here are highly industrious, using a range of artistic tools and equipment as they draw and paint their model. They also carefully scrutinize their work and they discuss it with their fellow students. It is a scene of learning, study and practice, of individual and collective effort, of camaraderie, of sorority, perhaps also of competition, certainly a scene of hard work and dedication. There are many details in the painting which illuminate the realities of everyday life and work in the studio and the means of teaching employed there. Life studies are displayed on one wall, while a skeleton is mounted on another to help with the study of anatomy. Drawing and painting the human form is an essential discipline here. Some of the students have easels, while others use chairs as supports for their work. The student in the dark blue apron, who is prominent in the foreground, seems to have just arrived, and although she does not yet have easel or canvas, is setting up her palette in traditional style. Light colours near at hand, darker shades further along on the far side, and plenty of the flesh tones she will need to paint the model. Her box of paints and equipment lies on the floor at her feet, with her brushes wrapped in a page from Le Figaro. We know the name of this student and the identities of some of the others. More on that later. What else can we see? To shield her face from the bright light coming in from the skylights, one of the women is working with a folded newspaper sheet on her head. There is a clock on the wall. In the corner behind the model is a stove with its flue rising towards the ceiling. A gas lamp extends from the wall on a swivelling bracket. There is a sketchbook lying open on a chair with its pages flapping. On the wall hangs a spare pallet. And somebody has left their lunch on a corner of the model's platform. In the lower left corner of the canvas is the artist's signature and the date. M. Bashkirtsev, 1881. The use of initial, rather than first name, serves to conceal the sex of the artist, a strategy often used by female painters who wanted their work to be viewed without preconceptions. Above is another erased signature, Andre. This is the pseudonym under which Marie Bashkirtsev submitted her painting to the Salon. I have signed it André, she explains in her journal. That will be my name. It works in French and in Russian. Despite all this, the compilers of the official Salon listings managed to get the name wrong and printed it as Audrey.
In the studio is painted in oils on canvas with flat areas of colour, modelled with a combination of smooth, thin washes, robust modelling of forms, and details shaped by small strokes of a fairly dry brush. Overall, it has the smooth finish typical of the academic style of painting favoured at Parisian art schools and at the Salon. No rough brushwork or bare canvas here. The light is even, with no strong shadows. The brightest area is around the model. The colour palette is a fairly restricted one, almost sombre, which is typical of Bashkirtsev's work and of the realist school to which he belonged. The handling of the colour is highly accomplished. Despite the subdued tonal quality of the painting, there is nothing dull or monotonous about it. The colour is exactly what it needs to be, and exactly where it needs to be. Here we see the way in which the areas of red in the left-hand half of the painting interact with the bright flashes of white in the centre and right, and with the dark and light blues in the middle, which, with the blue tints of the background wall, help to bind the whole picture together. The positioning of darker figures in the foreground and towards the edges, with lighter figures grouped behind them and framed by them, not only increases the viewer's sense of looking into a three-dimensional space and being drawn into it, but leads the gaze towards the heart of the studio, increasing the viewer's engagement with the busy scene depicted. The structure of the picture conveys both the smallness of the space and the atmosphere of activity that fills it. Strong horizontals underlie the composition and are very evident in the upper portion, but they are cut off before they reach the edges of the canvas, increasing the sense of enclosure, and in the lower part of the picture they almost disappear among the figures and the furniture. The same is true of the vertical lines of the composition, which are very clear in the upper portion, disappearing in the bustle and activity lower down. The lines of the floorboards, receding according to perspective, draw the viewer's gaze into the scene and create three-dimensionality, but also emphasise the clutter of the scene as so little of the floor is visible. The viewer is invited to enter the picture space, but would certainly bump into a chair or trip over a painting box or somebody's skirts before getting very far. We know from Bashkirtsev's journal that she struggled with the composition of the picture and with the perspective, and that she was dissatisfied with the final outcome. But what she created was a highly successful painting, which conveys the sense of a cluttered and busy scene, but also an ordered one, organised towards a particular purpose. Above the intense and focused activity of the studio floor, in the more open space of the upper part of the canvas, is the realm towards which the figures busily striving in the lower portion are aspiring, the realm of art, exemplified by the academic figure studies that preside like classical deities from high on the walls over the students' heads. And who are the students? There are 16 human figures in the picture, if you don't count the skeleton. One of these is the boy model, the only male in this single-sex space. That leaves the 15 female students. We do not know who all these women are. In some cases, their faces are hidden, others may not be portraits at all, and given that there were 40 or 50 women studying at Julian's at the time when Bashkirtsev was painting this picture, there is a wide choice of possible subjects. However, the identities of four of the students can be confirmed, from Bashkirtsev's own account in her journal and from other sources, notably an article published in 1907 by Mary Brakel 
an English artist and a contemporary of Bashkirtsev at the Academy Julien. Bashkirtsev wrote of having two main models. Alice Brisbane, who was American and went on to marry an Englishman and to have her portrait painted in 1898 by John Singer Sargent, and Marie de Villeville, a Frenchwoman of aristocratic descent. Both these figures can be identified from the artist's own description and from Brakel's account. They are prominent in the foreground of the picture, with Villeville standing very stylishly dressed and with a hint of haughtiness in her demeanour, and Brisbane seated wearing a practical blue painting apron and a large hat. In the centre of the canvas, with blonde hair tied back and wearing a light blue apron, is the third of the identifiable figures, the French artist Marie Magdalene Delsart, who went on to a successful career as an artist and an influential art teacher. The prominent figure of Alice Brisbane is sometimes described by commentators on this painting as a self-portrait by Marie Bashkirtsev. This is entirely incorrect. The artist has indeed painted herself into the picture, but not in the centre and not with her face visible. On the contrary, she is the figure on the far right-hand edge of the canvas, alone and with her back to the viewer. Why has Mary Bashkirtsev positioned herself in this way, set apart from all her fellow students, an isolated figure at the margins of the painting? As she worked on this picture, she knew herself to be very ill, and was increasingly certain she did not have long to live. Death was a constant reality for her. In January 1881, Thinking about the skeleton in the studio, she wrote, A skeleton is in me, too. We all end up like that. Horrible nothingness. She has so placed herself in her painting that the skeleton is suspended directly above her head, so that death is literally hanging over her. Higher up on the wall hangs the clock, reminding her that her life is ticking away. As her journal reveals, Marie Bashkirtsev lived at a great pace and pursued a very active social life, constantly attending dinners, parties, dances, the opera, with a great number and variety of people, but her writings also bear witness that she often felt lonely and isolated. From a very young age she believed she had a destiny, a call to greatness, which others did not understand. Her relationship with her family was difficult. She felt true friendship to be unattainable. She never found lasting love or affection. Her increasing deafness, a consequence of her tuberculosis, cut her off from human society, and her worsening illness was a doom that came between her and those around her. So she painted herself, alone, turning her back upon the world to concern herself solely with art, working at her picture with death hanging over her and time running out. in the studio was well received at the 1881 Salon. Marie herself was happy with its location and its appearance, writing in her journal that she was astonished that the picture looked so good. It's not good, but I was expecting a true horror, and instead it's nice. Reviewers noted the excellent finish of the picture and praised the expressiveness of the faces, the skilful handling of the figures with their varied postures and sense of movement, and the high standard of the design and the colouring. Marie noted with pleasure that she received many great compliments from people who understood painting and thus recognised her accomplishment. Seeing a fair-sized picture with a number of people in it, 
They find it very acceptable, she wrote. After the salon closed, Rodolphe Julien did not, as he had suggested he might, claim the painting for himself, so it came back to Marie Bashkirtsev's studio, where it seems to have remained until her death. After Marie died, her paintings and other artworks came to her mother, who in 1908 donated most of them to the Russian Imperial Museum in St. Petersburg, today the State Russian Museum. During the 1930s, many were redistributed to museums in Ukraine, where, during the Second World War, a large number of them were lost, stolen or destroyed. It is estimated that more than 100 of her works disappeared in this way. In the studio, however, survived and remains in the collection of Dnipro Art Museum in Ukraine, one of just three of her paintings to remain in the land of Marie Bashkirtsev's birth. Why is this painting important? Partly because it is a significant survival from the much depleted oeuvre of an artist who, although relatively obscure today, was one of the most famous women of her era. It is also an important first-hand record of a women's art studio from the late 19th century, a period of great importance in the history of women artists and women's art education. The art studio was, for Marie Bashkirtsev, a realm apart from ordinary life, in which only art and the individual artist mattered. When she started her studies at the Académie Julien, she wrote, All distinctions disappear in the studio. I have neither name nor family. I am not my mother's daughter. I am myself, an individual, with art in front of me. Art and nothing else. I feel so happy, so free so proud. In the studio, with its depiction of women art students at work, brings together the two most deeply felt causes of Mary Bashkirtsev's life, the pursuit of art and the struggle for women's rights. She believed women had a right to obtain artistic training, to master artistic skills and to establish artistic careers. She wanted to bring down the barriers that prevented women artists from achieving their ambitions. Slowly, those barriers were beginning to come down during her lifetime, and this painting is both evidence of that change and an eloquent argument in favour of it. The women in her picture are not decoratively and unproductively posed, nor are they idealised. They are real women artists, working hard at the profession of art, their profession making its tools and spaces their own, using their gaze and their skills to create their art. They demand to be taken seriously. That is why this painting mattered when Marie Bashkirtsev painted it, and why it continues to matter today. <laughs>